Hey, what's up, Flatirons Online? Welcome back. We are in the last week of a series called Pieces, where we've been talking about what Jesus said was the greatest commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this week, we're going to be talking about what he said was like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to connect with us, you can do that on flatironschurch.com or on social media. Hope you enjoy.
sing these words together as a reminder of our God-given identity this morning. Let's sing. That I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. We sing. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. We believe I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say. Flatirons, how are we doing this morning? Did you guys have just a beautiful, sunny Saturday afternoon? Yeah, and who's excited about snow today? You know, uh, yeah. You guys are my people, okay? You're crazy. Um, hey, just wanted to say welcome to everybody who's watching online. We've got groups that are watching from Arizona, Illinois, Oregon. Um, and if there's a group watching from Hawaii, just want to throw it out there. You know, like we would sacrifice and come visit you sometime. So just let us know if you're out there. Hey, um, and then will you guys just give it up for the gentleman joining us from God Behind Bars in Lyman. As always, we're just so glad that they're with us. Hey, my name's Jesse. I've got three things for us this morning. The first one is this. Last week, we mentioned the Police Unity Tour is having a concert here on March First, with the local band Face, this is a fundraiser and it is a great way to support both local and national law enforcement. So you can get tickets online, you can also get tickets right out that way as you leave, and so make sure that you check that out if you wanna support law enforcement. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is uh, we've got some international mission trips that are heading out here in the near future, and here's, what, here's why we take trips to our international partners. It's because we believe that what God's up to, it's not just isolated at Flatirons or Denver or America, but what God's doing is all around the world, and we want to be a part of it. We want to jump in. And so we've got two, uh, two trips heading to Musana in Uganda, and these are for educators. And so if, if you're a teacher, if you're a school administrator, maybe you're a retired teacher, this is the perfect opportunity to use the training that you've received and then go help train some teachers in Uganda. And so uh, that trip, you can get information online on that. And then also, if you're a young adult or you just have a deep passion, you care about young adults, we're taking a trip to Global Scope. They're our young adult partner in Brisbane, Australia. And so if you're a young adult or care about young adults, check out those trips. You can go to the website, flatironschurch.com outreach and get all the information about those trips. 
And then the last thing that I've got for us today is today marks our spring group launch. We've been uh, doing groups here as a church for about two years, and it really has changed things because it's taken what we learn here in rows, what we learn in this room, and we're actually able to get into a circle, get into a group, and apply it. We get to grow together as a group. It's been amazing. How many people in the room are a part of a group or have been a part of a group? So it, it's just been this kind of incredible thing to watch God grow us as as a church as we get in these smaller circles. He's done amazing things. Check out this video. It's just one of the stories that God has done through groups. Check this out. I am Christine Saletta, and I am a leader and a coach for Flatirons Groups. And my name is Lexi Kelly, and I am in Christine's group, and I was the first member to sign up. So when I started attending Flatirons, I talked to my family and friends about what I was learning and how much I enjoyed it. And so my son Justin, 37 years old, started attending with me. And he really connected in a way that he hadn't for a long time. So in February of last year though, he had not been feeling well. And he went into the hospital and they discovered that he had complications from a heart valve defect. And the doctor said that he would not survive surgery to replace the heart valve. But when he was in the hospital, we had a conversation and he said, Mom, me and God are good. And I felt like he really had returned back to a relationship with Jesus that he hadn't had for a long time. And on March 1st, he passed away. And my group said, what can we do for you? And they've really been there for me, prayed for me, let me cry in group, supported me through this past year in a way that I didn't think was possible. We have had some very, very challenging times uh, individually in our group and in having that, that space and, and those um, beautiful, beautiful Christian people <laughs> to, um, to have conversations, to pray, to talk, to cry, to laugh um, mm -hmm. is, is um, it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. So if there are people in the audience that are hesitant about signing up for a group, just go online and sign up and give it a try. And God will really lead you to where you need to be. I can't imagine my life without my group. That is uh, the church being the church right there, and it all happened in a group, in a circle. If you're interesting, interested in joining one of our groups, you can get more information or register online or out in the lobby. You can get information right there. Uh, well, we're going to jump into week five of our series pieces. Ben's going to wrap up the, the series, but before he does that, I'm going to pray, and then the band's got one more song for us. But let's pray. God, I... Uh, God, we, I thank you that, God, you just allow us to bring every part of us to you, even when we're in pieces. And God, the most amazing thing is that sometimes you use other people to pick up these pieces and bring them back to you. And God, you put us back together, but you use people as a part of that process. And God, I'm just so grateful that you allow us to be a part of that. God, I pray that you would uh, teach us how you can make us whole. God, how you can bring us peace even when our life is in pieces. God, teach us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to do church, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Joe Cocker fan in general. Um, I do want you to be aware, we did change the lyrics from I get high with my friends to I get by with my friends. I thought that was a good step for us, right? Because not, not, I haven't gotten high since college when I, I didn't follow Jesus, but many times since then I've gotten by. So I feel like that's fair. Um, also, just to kind of gauge who I'm working with here, I can't hear that song without thinking about the TV show, The Wonder Years, anyone? The Wonder Years? Yeah, okay, nice. Great show. Winnie Cooper was my first love. 
It didn't work out. That's fine. Um, I met Allie, so that's good. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Ben. I'm the teaching pastor here. Very glad you're here today. Um, I'm excited about today because uh, we're going to talk about some of the themes we just heard in that song, this concept of we need each other and, and we need our friends and our friends need us. And actually, our friends need something very specific from us. And, and today comes with kind of an in-your-face challenge, uh, which is what we do at Flatirons, but it's a challenge that's like core to our DNA of who we are as a community of people. So I'm very excited about it. And I want to jump in. Um, to kind of catch you up to speed, today we are ending and wrapping up this series we've called Pieces, where we've been taking a look at the different parts of our lives that have broken into pieces. And we've been asking questions like, God, what do you have to say about these broken parts of our lives? And God, is there any chance out there that we could be put back together again? And to answer that week after week, we keep going back to this moment from Jesus's life where he says basically, yes, absolutely. Yes, it is possible that you can be put back together again. To refresh our memories, I wanna look at that verse real quick. It happens when a guy comes up to Jesus and he asks him a question. He says, hey, Jesus, what is the greatest, most important commandment that God ever gave us? In other words, what is the most important thing I could possibly be doing with my life? And here's Jesus's answer. He says, the most important one, so the most important thing you and I could possibly be doing with our lives is this. And then Jesus quotes something called the Shema from the Old Testament, which we've talked about for the last few weeks. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Basically, Jesus just says, God is not in pieces, even though we are. In fact, God is one and whole, even though we are broken and divided. And so the most important thing we could possibly be doing with our lives is giving the broken parts of ourselves over to the one who knows how to put us back together. That's God. And if we give God our shattered heart, soul, mind, and strength, then slowly but surely over time, he'll start putting us back together again. That's what we've spent four weeks talking about. And that sounds great. Right? No one would disagree with that. It sounds great to have a life that feels whole and complete and full and at peace. We want that. We want all the king's horses and all the king's men to put us back together again. It sounds great, and God will do that for us. But, and today we're gonna talk about the but. God will do that for us, but there's something we need to remember. We need to remember that Jesus putting us back together is actually not his end goal for our lives. He wants more for us, and he wants more for the world that we live in, which is why to end the series today, I wanna to talk about the second part of Jesus's greatest commandment, the thing we just read, because according to Jesus, the second part is inseparable from the first part. All right, so here's the second part of Jesus's great commandment. Let's jump in. So remember the first one, the most important one, the first part is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then Jesus doesn't stop there. He keeps going. And he says the second, the second part is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love and care for the people around you in the same way that you would hope to be loved and cared for. And then Jesus says there is no commandment greater than these. See, according to Jesus, the number one most important thing you and I could be doing with our lives is to love God and love people. Jesus says there's no commandment, singular, greater than that, singular, meaning Jesus says that the two can't be separated. Each component, love God and love people, it's incomplete without the other one. They have to go together. It's the spiritual version of peanut butter and jelly, basically, right? Peanut butter, meh, jelly, meh. You put them together and you have the sandwich of God and country, right? Um, that's what he's saying. He says, love God and love people. Those two things working together in unison is the greatest commandment. The problem, though, is that you and I have a tendency to take this greatest commandment and break it into pieces, there's love God and there's love people and we wanna do one without the other. And whenever we do that, it's bad news. All right, for example, to isolate one of them, th this is according to Jesus, all right? This is Jesus' words, not mine. So don't send me an email, send him one. I'm sure he's got a Hotmail account or something like that. Um, he says, if you love people without also loving God, he says it's empty and it's hollow and it's meaningless. Jesus, in fact, calls it the blind leading the blind. He says, you both, neither one of you just know where you're going. You don't know what you're aiming at. One day, you'll both fall off the cliff. 
In the reverse, he says that if we love God without also loving people, Jesus says that is just as hollow and empty and meaningless. There's actually entire books of the Bible written where God damns that as empty religion. You can go read Isaiah 1 sometime if you want a wake-up call. We're not gonna read it now, but in the first chapter of Isaiah, God calls religion, our religion, so when, when it was originally written, he's talking to the Jewish people. For us to relate, he says, Christianity is, quote, meaningless, detestable, and a burden that his soul hates to bear if we are not also caring for the oppressed and the widow and the orphan and the immigrant and the down and out, if we're not also caring for our friends and family and coworkers and even our enemies. The two have to go together. Jesus' end goal for our lives is not simply to love God. His end goal for our lives is not simply to love people. It's both at the same time working together. Jesus' end goal for our lives is to love God and also love people. And, and, and there's a ton of ways that we can love and care for people, right? We've talked about loving God for the last few weeks. Let's talk about loving people. There's a million ways you can do that in a way that's faithful to God. But today I wanna look at a different moment from Jesus's life where this whole love God and love people thing is on display. It's a great story. It's found in Luke chapter five. And the story starts like this. All right, so one day as he, Jesus, was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. All right, that's how the story starts. So one day Jesus is teaching, he's healing people. Naturally, this crowd just gathers. They wanna hear him teach, but really they wanna see if he's gonna do some crazy Jesus miracle thing. You would travel a lot of miles to see that. I would too, and so a crowd forms. And he's in this house, we're about to learn he's in a house, teaching, healing people, and he's surrounded by this crowd. And Luke, the author, specifically tells us that the majority of this crowd is made up of Pharisees and teachers of the law. That's important to remember. We're gonna come back to it. It's important to remember that this crowd is mostly religious people. All right, here's what happens next. So some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, on a stretcher, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him and his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now, we have this tendency when we read old historical accounts, whether it's the Bible or anything else, we read Shakespeare or something like that, it's like the language is confusing and a little bit outdated, so we have trouble picturing it. Let's try picturing this moment right now together because it's crazy what's happening. Right, you got these men, they're running a stretcher with their paralyzed buddy on it. They need their friend to come and see Jesus. He needs to be healed, right? But they can't get in because of the crowd, so they're stuck outside. At the same time, these guys are determined, right? They didn't bring their friend all the way here to just give up and go home. So they start game planning, right? And they're throwing out ideas of what they can do, and maybe it gets quiet for a second, and then one of them just goes, wait, 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 I have a crazy idea which is how every great story begins, right? It's so usually me and my buddies on the porch and I'm like, wait, yeah, hold my beer. I have a crazy idea. <laughs> and the rest is gonna be good. It is in this story too. And so these guys get the stretcher onto the roof. This is where the whole thing goes Monty Python on us because they start digging through grass and mud and sticks, all the stuff that made for mortar back in that day. They're pulling up roof tiles. They're trying to make a hole in this dude, random dude's roof in order to lower a stretcher down into the living room. They are behaving like crazy people. But then again, we do crazy things for the people we love, don't we? I mean, I, I basically lost my mind for the first year that I met my wife, Allie. I did. I made late night deliveries of chocolate pudding to her dorm just because I knew she liked it. Like one of the few things I knew she liked. <laughs> um, I also volunteered one night to watch the movie Grease with her. That's certifiably insane for an adult man to do that. <laughs> but I did it because I loved her. We do crazy things for the people we love. That's what these guys are doing. All right, so they're digging a hole in the roof. I like to imagine, meanwhile, what is going on inside the house? Because we know Jesus is teaching. So maybe he's telling a parable, right? You know, God is kind of like a shepherd who left everything to go and find the one lost sheep who had wandered away. Everyone's quiet and listening, even though up on the roof, there's just like <laughs> the whole time they're trying to listen. The story starts to get good and maybe some dirt and mud falls into Jesus's hair or something. So this whole crowd in unison like looks at the ceiling just in time for like roof tiles to come crashing to the floor. There's dust everywhere, dirt everywhere. People are coughing and in the middle of the chaos, just this stretcher, <laughs> right? I like to picture what is this paralyzed guy thinking? 
Because this is a socially awkward situation that he's found himself in, you know? I like to think that as he's being lowered, he's just trying to play it off, you know? Like, pardon, sorry, coming through, you know? Probably saying hi to people he knows, like Steve, Carol. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be out of your hair in a minute, is what you think of saying? <laughs> I like to think the dude who owns the house, he's probably standing in the corner looking at this hole in the ceiling, just saying every four-letter word he can think of, you know? Probably the local roof repair guy is like slipping business cards into his pocket. <laughs> yeah. You need help with that, you call me. It's a crazy situation, all right? But this crazy thing happens, and then here we are, all right? This big religious crowd, stunned to silence, the dust begins to settle, and there's a paralyzed man laying on the floor in front of Jesus, And then Jesus breaks the silence. And Luke, the author, tells us that when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the paralyzed man and and the faith of that guy's buddies, he said to the paralyzed man, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, we don't know how the man reacted, but he's a real man. And so I assume he reacted like I would have, which is like, oh, okay, you know, thank you that my sins are forgiven, you know, but that's not really why we tore a hole in the roof, you know, I kind of more need help with being crippled. That's how I would have reacted. You can't blame him either, right? The number one thing that that man needs and that you and I need is to be forgiven and to be reconnected to God. Is that why you walked in here for the first time? Probably not, Right? You probably walked in here because you didn't know where else to go and you couldn't pay the bills or your marriage was on life support. You couldn't kick the addiction. That's the problem we need help with right now. This is the problem the man needs help with right now. I bet he felt disappointed at first. How does the religious crowd react? Well, the Bible does tell us and they have a pretty typical religious person reaction. They find something to criticize. It says this, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy and who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus isn't thick. He knows what's going on. Jesus knew what they were thinking and he asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? And then he says this, he says, which is easier, all right, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? So in other words, he basically says, which one of those statements is more difficult for me to prove in the moment that I have the authority to do it? Then he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, so you know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he turns to the paralyzed man and he says, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. What happens next? Well, immediately the man stood up in front of him and he took what he had been lying on. He went and picked up his stretcher and he went home praising God and everyone was amazed and gave praise to God and they were filled with awe and they said, we have seen remarkable things today. And they had. And then that's it, the end, all right? Story over, crowd disperses, Jesus moves on to the next thing. Now, there's a dozen different things that we could take out of this story and learn right now, but here's what I wanna focus on today. I wanna focus on the two types of people that we see in this story. The first group of people is the paralyzed guy's buddies. It's the, the men carrying the stretcher. And the men carrying the stretcher are doing something that here at Flatirons we call, come and see, Sometimes we use the fancy term, which is relational evangelism, but come and see. Come and see is is one of only five of our core values here at Flatirons, which means it's one of the very few things we've said we absolutely refuse to let go of this. Come hell or high water, we'll never let go of come and see here at Flatirons. Come and see means that if you've put your faith in Jesus, then because of what he's done in your life, we believe the most loving thing you could possibly do is to go invite other people to just come and see Jesus and come and see what he's done for them. All right? It's not spiritual bullying. It's also not being the weird guy at work who's like, if you enjoy Led Zeppelin, you might like this Hillsong worship album. It's not being weird. All right? It's just it's lovingly inviting people to come and see the person, Jesus, who is putting you back together. Just come and see, no pressure. Just come and check this Jesus guy out. These guys are living out one of our core values. They've got their paralyzed buddy on stretcher, running him to Jesus. They know that if their friend is going to be healed, it's only gonna be because he came to see Jesus. These guys are putting come and see into practice, right? But then they show up to the house. They can't get inside the house because of the crowd. That's the second group of people I want to talk about right now. Because remember who the crowd is made up of. It's made up of religious people. So you've got this guy. He's broken in pieces on the stretcher. He needs to come and see Jesus, but he can't get near him because the doorway is blocked by religious people. 
And these religious people who have crowded the house and made it impossible for anyone else to get in, they're not running through the streets and they're not picking up stretchers, bringing their friends to come and see Jesus. They aren't living out the value of come and see. Instead, they are a stay and watch crowd. This moment with Jesus is for them and for them alone. And the value of stay and watch is this dangerous territory that any religious person, any Christian can fall into if we're not careful, myself included. When we fall into stay and watch, we never intended to. You know, at first we were so excited to go get our friends and our family and, and, and have them come and see the one who's putting us back together. But eventually over time, maybe, you know, you got your invites turned down too many times, it felt defeating, whatever it is, over time we eventually fall into this place where we take Jesus's greatest commandment, love God and love people, and we break it into pieces. And then eventually we slip into this false belief this false belief that we think the most important thing that God wants us to be doing in this life is loving him and like knowing more information about him. And we're supposed to be doing that at the expense of loving other people. And I think it's worth it right now to to take a look, not, not as a church community at large, but for each one of us individually to take a good, hard, honest, painful look at ourselves to see, are I, am I living my life out of the come and see value or the stay and watch value? Here are some indicators of what it looks like if you're a stay and watch type of person, all right? This is stuff that I have fallen into in the past. I will fall into it again in the future. I'll need to be made aware of it. I'm not throwing judgment or condemnation. I'm simply describing what a stay and watch crowd looks like. So if we think that church is something that only happens on the weekend, right, here at specifically four o'clock, six o'clock, nine, and 11, we might be stay and watch. And if we think this hour-long service right now is for us Christians and us Christians only, we might be stay and watch. If we find ourselves critiquing a lot of stuff that happens here or or that happens at any other church uh, because we're, quote, not being fed or we're not getting enough out of it, we might be stay and watch. If we get mad when we show up and someone is sitting in our regular seats, might be stay and watch. (laughs) And if we roll our eyes at the kind of people who walk in the doors because they're not in their Sunday's best or they have one too many tattoos, we might be stay and watch. And whenever we stay and watch, what we do is we, we circle the wagons with other Christian people and Jesus becomes someone who is for us and for us only. And everyone else needs to get out of our, our circle right now because they're too broken and they're too messy and they're distracting us from the most important thing of loving God and knowing him better. See how when we stay and watch, we take Jesus's greatest commandment, love God and love people, and we throw away the love people part in favor of learning some new Greek words or something. And whenever we become entrenched in stay and watch, eventually we just let go of come and see. We stop bringing our friends and our family in on stretchers. And instead, like the story from Jesus's life, we just become this big religious crowd that makes a better door than a window. And we block the view and accessibility of Jesus from the people who are on stretchers, the people who need him like right now. In other words, And I know this will sound harsh, and I'm sorry if it's harsh, but sometimes the truth is harsh, and this is just what we see in the story from Jesus's life. The truth is, when we stay and watch, we're just in the way. We are in the way of the mission that Jesus wants to accomplish on this planet, and at that point, according to Jesus, not me, this flat irons thing will become hollow and empty and meaningless. That might bring up emotion. I'm sure a lot of you are annoyed at me, and maybe some of you are even furious at me. And so before we get into this next part, let me address who I'm not talking to right now, all right? So for the rest of this thing, I am not talking to anyone who isn't sure about faith. You're not sure what you believe about Jesus. You're just here checking the thing out. If that is you, you are welcome, all right? You'll always be welcome here. For for as long as I and anyone on the staff has a say in it, this will be a safe place for you to just come and see, right? You have the freedom to be as known or as anonymous as you want to be. And you have the freedom to just sit in the back and kind of cautiously engage for as long as you'd like, right? If you got questions about this Jesus stuff, I will be in the lobby after this. I would love to talk to you about that. If talking to me sounds terrible, that's cool, just leave, all right? I'm not gonna go follow you out the door and be like, I notice you're new and I don't know your name and I need you to fill this thing out. I've been to that church, it's terrible, all right? You're free to chill, all right? Welcome. 
So I'm not talking to anyone who you're not sure what you believe when it comes to Jesus yet. For the rest of this thing, I'm also not talking to anyone who is currently on the stretcher. What I mean by that is, is real life is really hard, and we know that. And so we go through these seasons where life knocks us like flat on the back, right? The, the, the cancer, the divorce, the sudden death of a loved one, bankruptcy, the like really, really hard stuff that shatters us into pieces. I mean, the series is called Pieces. It's for those of us who feel especially broken right now. We're on the stretcher. We've been you know, lowered through the roof, and we're in front of Jesus asking him, can you forgive me, and can you put me back together again? That describes where you're at in this phase of life, that you're on the stretcher, then you are free here at Flatirons to rest and recover. It's gonna take time for Jesus to put our broken pieces back together. It's gonna take time to heal. Do that, do that here. Don't go do that out there on your own. All right, for the rest of this, I'm not talking to anyone who isn't sure what they believe in Jesus or anyone who is on the stretcher. But for the rest of the talk, here's who I am speaking to. All right? I am talking to those of us who follow Jesus and, I mean, who knows what tomorrow is gonna bring, but for today, we're also not knocked out on the stretcher. All right? We're not perfect, of course. Who is? No, one, no one's perfect this side of eternity, so we're not perfect, but we are just in this lucky, like blessed season of life where we're not shattered into a million pieces. If you could fit into that category, I would put myself in that category for this phase of my life. When Jesus says, love God and also love people, he is talking to us. And I believe he's telling us the same thing that he told that paralyzed man in that house 2,000 years ago. I think he's telling us to get up, take your mat, and go home. When I was studying this passage last week, those three words jumped out of the page at me for really the first time ever. I've read it thousands of times. Take your mat. Why would Jesus say that? got to understand that this man probably lived on that stretcher for his entire life, right? Back in that culture, he would have been hauled out every day to the street or to the temple to beg for money all day long. He would have been hauled back home for dinner and bed. That was his entire life, day in, day out on that stretcher. Not anymore though, right? Jesus just healed him. He can walk now. And so it begs the question, why does Jesus tell him to take his stretcher? Why isn't he free to just throw it in the trash? Seriously, what does this guy need that stretcher for anymore? Here's why I think Jesus told the man to take the stretcher. I think it's the same thing Jesus is telling us today. I think Jesus is saying this. He's saying, if I've healed you to the point where you can stand up off the stretcher, pick it up and go home with it to your friends and your family and your coworkers and your neighbors, the people who are broken and in pieces, the people who desperately need to come and see me, take your stretcher, load someone else onto it and carry them back here to me. See, when Jesus heals our broken pieces, when he heals these massive parts of our lives, it's never the end goal in and of itself. He never heals us so that we can be more comfortable to just sit and stay and watch and learn. Instead, he heals us so that we can get up and go home and carry the stretcher for someone else so that we can invite someone else to come and see this person who is putting us back together again. And at Flatirons, we are committed to that. If you're new here, I hope this sets up good expectations for you. And if you've been here for a while, I hope this is a good reminder. But here at Flatirons, we refuse to become a stay and watch crowd. It's one of our core values. We don't want to walk down that empty, hollow, meaningless path, which means we'll never settle, all right? We'll never settle for like self-centered, inward-focused religion, you know, with strange words that our friends can't understand and can't connect to. And we'll never settle for that attitude of like, we're here to be fed and then that's it, right? We're here to learn an interesting Hebrew word and sing some songs and feel warm and fuzzy for an hour, and that's it. After that, we're just going to go home without picking up our stretcher and loading someone else onto it. We won't settle for it. And the reason we won't settle for it is because we have friends and family and neighbors and coworkers. We have people in our lives that we care about who are wandering in pieces through a lost and broken world. And they are wandering with no map, and no light at the end of the tunnel, and no hope, and no Jesus, and we refuse to abandon them, to just figure it out on their own. We are not a stay and watch community. We are a come and see community. 
We are a group of people committed to sharing the hope that we found in Jesus with the people around us and sharing it in a real, raw, authentic, sometimes painfully vulnerable, but easy to grasp way. If that doesn't sound like your cup of tea, that's fine, I guess. All right? I'm not gonna grab a pitchfork and run you out the door or something. I can assume that you'll probably just always feel frustrated here. So never quite be the crowd that you're meant to run with because we're committed to making Jesus accessible instead of blocking the door away with like super deep religious trivia. And that's because we believe it's actually possible to grow very deeply in a relationship with Jesus and do it in a way that doesn't alienate other people. But for those of us who, who feel our hearts beating faster at Jesus's vision of being a come and see church, I have a challenge for us. It is a challenge that's in your face It's deeply personal, and it might even be invasive. But the challenge is this. Are we ready to pick up the stretcher? Are we ready to invite our our neighbors and friends and our family and come carry them to come and see the one who's putting us back together? Why would that be an important thing to do? Well, it's the most important thing to do, and that's because we believe that the world needs Jesus. And we also believe that for some crazy reason, Jesus chose people like us, you and me, to carry people to him. And the truth is we have people we care about, people we love out there, and the world has written them a check and it bounced. The world told them that with the right diet, and the right exercise or with the right self-help mantra or podcast or book or political stance, with the right amount of money in your paycheck to buy the right sized house in the right neighborhood, the world has told them that if only they could get some of those things right, they would finally feel whole and full and complete and their life would be at peace. The world wrote them that check and it bounced. It bounced for us too, didn't it? Don't don't ever forget the moment when it bounced. Don't ever forget the way that it felt when when that promise came crashing down because it means that our friends and our family are in the same spot we were in back when the check bounced. They are lost with no map. They are broken with no hope of healing and they are doubling down on old habits and addictions and patterns, the stuff that left them broken into pieces in the first place and they're hoping that this time it's gonna be different. Guess what? It's not going to be different. We know that because we've been there. So pick up the stretcher. Don't ever forget what it felt like when your world came crashing down around you. We remember what that felt like. And so we know that our friends and our family are going to spend tonight the same way that you and I used to spend our evenings, lying on the bed, staring at the ceiling, talking to ourselves, wondering, is this seriously it? Is this really all that life has to offer me? Is this seriously as good as it gets? No, it gets better. There's more out there. We know that. So pick up the stretcher. To reference one of my favorite quotes, it's it's attributed to a lot of different people. I first read it from Teddy Roosevelt. He said this, do something now, act. Do something now. If not you, who? Who? Right? And if not here, where? And if not now, when? If we're not gonna carry the stretcher to our friends and family, who will? And if we're not gonna bring them here to Flatirons, that's fine, doesn't hurt my feelings. Where are you going to bring them? And if we're not gonna do it now, what is it exactly that we're waiting on? Because I can tell you what our friends and our family are waiting on. They are waiting on us. Jesus said the greatest commandment the most important and valuable and fulfilling and life-giving thing that you and I could possibly be doing with our lives is to love God and also love people. And so to be as blunt as Jesus is on this subject, here at Flatirons, it's come and see or nothing. We have nothing else to offer the world other than come and see this Jesus who's putting us back together. And here at Flatirons, it's now or never. And here at Flatirons, it is pick up the stretcher and go home. Or frankly, move out of the way and clear the path for the people who are running stretchers. And I know that might sound harsh, but it is only because I genuinely believe that our friends and our family are going to be stuck, lying on the ground, broken to pieces until we take our stretchers to them and we put our arms around them and carry them to come and see the one who's put us back together. So what are we waiting for? Do something now on behalf of the people we care about. Don't leave them out there on their own. And let's do exactly what Jesus told us to, which is get up out of these seats, take your stretcher, the thing that has caused you so much pain over life, the reminder of who you used to be, 
and take that stretcher and go home to the friends and the family who desperately need you to love them right now. Pray with me. God, I pray for a few different people today. God, I pray for anyone who's just wandered in here, they've wandered online and they're watching it online. God, the people who, they, they're not sure what they believe when it comes to faith, not sure what they believe in this whole Jesus stuff. They're just here checking it out. God, I thank you so much for giving them this place to be free to do that. No judgment from us, no condemnation from us. They can ask the really, really difficult questions that they need to ask. They can figure it out. God, thank you for those people. God, for those of us who are, are knocked out flat and we're on the stretcher right now, God, heal us. God, in the midst of that pain, in the midst of what we're walking through in those moments where we turn to you and you feel like you're just not answering, we start to get mad at you, start to get angry, start to get confused by you. God, in those moments, give us some light at the end of the tunnel, some hope, heal us. And then God, for the rest of us in the room, God, for the people who have put our faith in you, we love you, we trust you, we're following you, and we're also not on the stretcher right now. God, please ignite this fire in us. Ignite in us the passion for your mission that you've been on for thousands of years, God. God, you operate in such a way where you say, don't worry about putting people back together again. I'll put people back together again. You just worry about bringing broken people to me. God, we would be honored to go on that mission with you. God, forgive us for any complacency in that. But God, ultimately, I pray that you ignite that mission in our hearts and that over the years, we bring our friends and our family to come and see you, the one who's putting us back together. And I hope that we get to have these moments where we sit in these seats on a weekend and our friends and our family are finally there and we get to say the same thing that those people said back in that story we just read. We get to say, we have seen remarkable things today. God, let us be a part of that with you. And God, ultimately, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who made this new life possible for us. He will make it possible for our friends and our family. And it's in his holy name that I pray, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, Flatirons, I'm gonna invite you to stand. When we're connected to Jesus, we're connected to his church, his body, we're connected to each other, which means that we have an opportunity right now in this moment to start doing what Ben just challenged us to do, to love God and out of that, to love people, to love each other, to use this song of praise and thanks to say to one another, come and see how good our God is. So as we sing this last song, let's unite our voices together as one. Let's join with our neighbors across this room, people who were strangers but are now brothers and sisters. Let's join with all our campuses who are singing this same song with us. Let's join with our brothers and sisters online, our brothers at God Behind Bars in Lyman, and let's use our voices and this song to carry one another to Jesus.
we've done and anything we face. So Flatirons Church, as one voice, let's sing this together. As you go out from here, no matter what you're walking into, just remember that you're not alone. We're with you. Your God is with you. There'll be prayer down the front. Buckets for your offering on the way out. We love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.